So what you're gonna need are some blocks or something that mimics a block. You can also use a chair. You're gonna need some blankets. I'd say two to three blankets, usually three is most beneficial. You can even use some towels that would uh, replace that same height. I have a strap that we might use at some point in class. Bolsters are awesome to have, but I try to give some variations so that they're not fully necessary. But um, you can also get something that maybe looks kind of like this long, fluffy pillow. So once you get all your stuff together, you can come to a comfortable seated posture. Specifically, we'll sit in a pose called Sukhasana today. So Sukhasana means sweet or easy pose. This is where the ankles are crossed. The knees are moving off to the side or draping off to the side. You wanna sit high enough so that you can sit up straight comfortably. If you notice any achiness in the hips or the spine, it might be helpful to get a little bit more support to sit on. As you take a few breaths here, you can rest your hands on your thighs with the palms facing down. And as you gently lengthen your inhale and exhale, start to close your eyes, soften your face. Use that weight of your palms resting on the thighs to act like an anchor for your mind. So often the mind will wander and drift and think about all kinds of things. But as you tune into that sensation of what it feels like to have your hands resting on the thighs, what does it feel like to the pressure on the hand? What does it feel like in relation to the thigh? And really giving that to your mind to focus on, acting as an anchor to come back to as the mind drifts and wanders. With every inhale and every exhale, try to expand your rib cage. Expand your lungs as much as you can. And with the exhale, letting go of that air fully, completely draining the lungs. Using this time to really bring your mind into your body and observe what it takes to focus on your breath. And on your next inhale, bring your hands together in Namskarasana. This is prayer pose. As the palms come together, you'll rest the base of your wrists at the base of your rib cage. And then the thumb stretches up towards the heart. And as you lift the elbows slightly, use that pressure of the palms to pull the shoulders towards the back of the body. Usually what you'll feel is not only a muscularization in the upper back to draw the shoulder blades, to draw the shoulders towards the spine, but also a stretching across the front of the chest. We'll start class today by chanting three ohms together as a group. If you've never done this before, you're welcome to just sit back and listen or you can give it a try. The sound OM is spelled A-U-M. So it kind of starts as if you're at a dentist saying, ah, and then the sound transforms into the O sound. So it sounds a little bit like ah. Go ahead and chant three of these together as a group. Let's start with an inhale. Ah Ah Next few breaths, 
Notice where the mind is, bringing your attention to your body, to that anchoring in the palms. Letting go of any tension in the face or the neck that might have risen. Keeping the chest lifting tall at the end of your next exhale, bring your chin down to your chest, surrendering the head to the heart, intellect to intuition. And release the hands to your thighs. Slowly lift your head and open the eyes. So since we've been seated with the legs crossed, let's switch the cross of the legs. Notice which leg is closest to you. And switch the cross, still in Sukhasana, with the ankles crossed and the knees wide. We're going to practice a couple of seated postures before we move on. So let's start with Parvatasana, which is little mountain pose. We're going to lace the fingers together, press the palms away so that the arms are nice and straight. So you take a nice deep inhale, lift the arms up and overhead. Now if you feel any achiness or pinching, really sharp sensations in the arms, you can go ahead and bring the arms down a little bit. Whichever height is suitable for you to practice today, take a moment to observe what's happening in the shoulders and in the neck. As you draw the shoulders down the spine, try to make some space between the ears and the tops of the shoulders. Even though the shoulders are moving down the back, we still want the side waists, we still want the front of the armpit to lift up. See if you can discern which area of your body is lifting and which area is descending. Try to envision the front of the body lifting tall while the back of the body is actually moving down towards the floor, draping and descending away from the head. Then bring your hands back down. Notice which pinky is on the loose end and we'll switch the grasp of the fingers. Pressing the arms away, lift the arms straight, take them up and overhead. Every inhale and every exhale, use that breath to create space in the sides of the rib cage. Create space in the collarbones or the top of the lungs. Notice how that can enhance that feeling of lifting the chest up while the shoulders move down to the floor. And then bring the hands down, resting the hands on the thighs. Now before we switch the cross of the legs and do this one more time, we're gonna add a little bit to the sequence. We're gonna do a little side lean so as you take your left hand to the floor, reach the right arm up and overhead. And we're kind of leaning over to the left side. Notice if that right hip wants to lift up with the reach of your right arm. Instead, see if you can anchor that right hip down. Maybe reach the right fingertips away. We're not necessarily worried about how far over you bend, but instead try to in, uh, integrate an upward rising sensation as you bend over to the side. And then we're gonna do the other side. So coming back upright, right hand down, and left arm reaches up. As you take a smooth, steady inhale, a smooth, steady exhale, try to fill that whole left side of the body. Notice if the left hip wants to rise with you and see if you can actually anchor that left hip down. That left sit bone moves into the floor and acts as an anchor as you reach those left fingertips over. And then back to center, sitting upright. Now we're gonna do that, that combination of poses with the legs in the other crossing. So noticing which leg is closest to you, you can switch the cross of the legs. Starting with Parvatasana, little mountain pose. Lace the fingers together, press the palms away, and take the arms up and overhead. Taking a nice deep inhale, deep exhale. Let go of any tension that might be held in the face or the eyes. And for this practice, go ahead and take your chin down to the chest. As the chin comes forward, the back of the neck can start to lengthen. And sometimes we can build a little bit more of a relationship with what the shoulders are doing, with what the upper back is doing. See if you can use that stretching feeling in the back of the neck to give you feedback 
on whether or not your shoulders are close to the ears or if you can start to pull them away from the ears a little bit more. And then lifting the head, bringing the hands down, noticing which pinky is on the loose end and we'll switch the grasp of the fingers. Pressing the palms away with the arms straight, taking the arms up and overhead, chin comes down to the chest. As you take a few breaths here, let the face and the eyes be soft while the body does a little bit more of the effort. Using that stretch in the neck to observe what's happening in the shoulders and how they relate to the ears, how close they might be. And then bringing the hands down, sitting up nice and tall. We're gonna start taking the legs wide. So if you need to adjust your mat, you can go ahead and do so. We'll start sitting on some blankets. You can take your feet to the floor, knees towards the ceiling, and then we stretch the legs out. I like to use my mat as a reference so that I can see if one heel or one hip is more mobile than the other. With the feet wide, take a few breaths here and reach the arms up and overhead. Once you get into Upavista Konasana, expanded angle pose, you can bend your knees a little bit and press your heels down to the floor. So even if the hamstrings are tight here, that's okay. You can use that to your benefit. There's a balance when we're dealing with tight hamstrings or discomfort in the low back. If you notice that the back is rounding and you're feeling quite heavy into the floor, not able to lift the chest up high, it can be helpful to sit on a higher blanket stack. But ultimately, we want to use that pressure of the heels to deepen the sit bones and really that pit of the thigh. So you can go ahead and bring your hands down. And as you place your, this area that's between your thumb and your index finger on your thigh, try to track up your thigh and observe where does that thigh meet the pelvis. And you're going to find this crease. We call it the pit of the thigh in Iyengar yoga. But as you find this pit of the thigh, take a note that we want that part of our body to move down while the chest lifts up, while the front of the armpits lift up. That makes this whole sideways start to get a little bit longer and you'll feel a little bit lighter in your pose in general. So again, taking the arms up and overhead, a little bend in the knees, press the heels down, hips down and lift the chest up. Now on an exhale, we're gonna move into a twist. So on your next exhale, twist to the left. You can take the left hand behind you, right arm across, taking a few breaths here and then lean forward towards your left leg. Notice if that right hip is lifting. See if you can press it down and stretch the right heel away from you. And then coming back up, reach the arms up and overhead. On an exhale, twisting off to the right. Taking a few breaths here to pull the shoulders back onto the spine and then leaning forward. As you bend forward, that bend really should be coming from that pit of the thigh rather than much rounding in the back. So keeping the chest lifting tall will help bring that bend in the hip. And then coming back up to sit. Now we're gonna bring the legs back together. So to come into what we call Bada Konasana, bound angle pose, you can do it a couple of different ways. The easiest quick way is to hook underneath the knee near the thigh and swing that heel in. If your knee is a little bit tender, it might be helpful to actually bend the knee straight up to the ceiling, bringing the heel towards the hip and then taking the knee off to the side. So take your time with this, pay attention to your body and what support it might need coming into Baddha Konasana, bound angle pose. All right, so moving on, we'll bring the legs together. What you're gonna need is a couple of blankets for this next pose. We're just gonna lie down in a supported back bend. So if you have a bolster, you might find that to be beneficial in this pose. But I think most of you guys are gonna have blankets or potentially even towels. So what we'll do is we'll unfold the blankets from what I call shelf fold, I usually call that shelf fold at the studio and then we open it up a little bit wider from there and we're going to roll the long edge now if you've done this before 
you could use maybe another rolled blanket and get a little bit of a thicker roll underneath your upper back. If you've never done this before, or you have any tenderness in the low back, it's gonna be a little bit nicer and more comfortable if you just use the one blanket. And then you're gonna need something to support underneath the head. So you're, you can use a blanket or two, or if you have a bolster, you can even put a bolster up here. This roll is gonna go across the upper back. Essentially, it's gonna support us right underneath where the armpit would be, but on the back of our body. So you can actually just watch me for a moment and then uh, we'll practice together and I'll walk you into it together as a group. There's a couple of things that I wanna point out to, to you with the position of the props and kind of the practice we're gonna go through. So I'm starting with my feet flat on the floor, knees bent. I'm gonna bring my elbows down to the blanket roll. And then as I spread my elbows off to the side, I wanna feel like this is quite high on my upper back. My elbows are gonna go on the other side of it and then my chest starts to curl and round over that rolled blanket. My head then comes to the blanket stack. Before we move on much deeper, we're gonna do a little bit of work with the neck. So if you're feeling any neck tension, this might be worthwhile to integrate into your regular practice. We'll bring the hands underneath the neck and I'm using my thumb to find the very base of my skull, the occiput, and I'm kind of giving a little pull little gentle pull of that base of the skull away from my shoulders to just try and lengthen out that back of the neck here. You can see that my chin starts to come towards the chest and then I can slowly start to lower my head down onto the blanket stack. You can have your hands in a position kind of like this which we call a hold them up or a goal post style position where you can reach the arms straight out to the side whichever is most comfortable for you. If you come into this position and you notice that your chin is lifting up towards the ceiling, you're gonna want some more support underneath the head. The general rule of thumb is that if you were to have a bead of water drop on your head, that it would start to roll towards your nose rather than roll to your forehead or the top of the head. So you want enough support underneath the head so that if you put a drop of water on the forehead, it would roll to the nose. Then we'll straighten the legs. If you feel any discomfort in the low back, go ahead and keep those knees bent. We'll be here for a few breaths and then we'll come up Can come up by bending the knees, feet to the floor, and then rolling off to the side and pressing yourself up. Alrighty, so that's the main thing is just getting that neck tractioning action. And that's really what I wanted to show you along with the keeping of the knees bent before we uh, straighten them. So as you get your props all set up, can go ahead and start to lay back onto your rolled blanket with the feet flat on the floor, knees bent, bring your elbows to that rolled blanket. And then you're gonna take a nice deep breath here and as you press the elbows down, lift the chest up towards the ceiling. Notice what the shoulders are doing. Are you resting on them and kind of lounging on the beach, so to say? Or can you press the elbows down, lift the chest up? And spread the elbows off to the side, you're gonna lay down on that rolled blanket. But as you do, notice as you kind of lean the shoulders towards the floor, they're gonna fall into that space between the rolled blanket and the blankets that are underneath your head. You should feel as though the shoulders are falling to the floor as the chest curls over that rolled blanket. You can bring the blankets under your head a little bit closer to the tops of the shoulders. And taking a few breaths here, really just absorbing what your body is feeling as you lay over that rolled blanket. Letting go of any unnecessary tension that might be held in the shoulders or the neck. And you'll take your hands, placing them underneath your head. Use your hands, it'll be, you'll have your fingers on the back of your head and your thumbs, you can actually feel and track up the sides of your neck, the back of the neck, and find where that neck meets the skull. There's this divot in the back of the head, near the base of the head, called the occiput. And this is where the neck meets the skull. And if you can dig your thumbs into the space and into the areas along the sides of that dimple, 
you can start to gently give a nice pull of the back of the neck away from the shoulders. You're now using your hands to traction some length for the back of the neck. You'll start to feel your chin come towards the chest, but rather than it being a forceful effort, see if you can accomplish that length simply by just letting go with every breath. Try and find a release of effort, a letting go of tension. With every inhale and every exhale, you might notice that it shifts, that that back of the neck gets a little longer. And when you feel you lengthen the back of the neck as long as it might go today, you could start to slowly pull your hands out towards the top of the head and bring them off to the sides. Just observe the position of the head, of the neck. And if you notice that the chin was lifting up towards the ceiling quite significantly, it might be best to grab another blanket, placing it under the head. If someone were to put a droplet of water on your forehead, which way would it fall? With every inhale and every exhale, notice how the back of the neck might try to integrate some tension. That it might, you might feel it tense up as you breathe. And so see if you can maintain that softness, that release in the back of the head, in the back of the neck, as you inhale and as you exhale. As you press your feet down into the floor, gently tuck your tailbone towards your heels. So you almost feel like you're scooping your pelvis towards the heels. The low back starts to round slightly towards the floor. Not necessarily digging into the floor, but you will feel the low back and the back of the pelvis round to the floor slightly. On an exhale, belly button in towards the spine. Keep that tuck of your tailbone and slowly straighten the legs one at a time. As you take a few breaths here, just observe the sensations in your body. And as you gently lengthen your inhale and exhale, try to fill the sides of the rib cage. Maybe even breathe into the back of the rib cage, the back of the lungs. As you keep a gentle pressure of your heels down into the floor, and the toes should point straight up to the ceiling. So there is a little bit of activity in the legs, in the lower body but let the upper body be completely soft. Notice how sometimes the whole body wants to be involved in the action. The whole body wants to be tense. See if you can soften the neck, the face, the jaw, even let go of any tension in the arms or the shoulders. And as you keep that gentle pressure of your heels, belly button draws into the spine. Feel that tuck of your tailbone towards the heels and the lower body. You'll notice that that pressure of your heels down, that pressure of the back of your thighs moving in towards the floor, a little bit of an anchor can start to focus on this area in your mind. As the back of the thighs press down, lift the spine, lift the chest over that rolled blanket. Still with the arms and the neck soft. So there is a little bit of activity happening in the body, happening in the spine. 
you feel discomfort in your low back, it's going to be beneficial to keep this activity in your legs. But if you feel fairly comfortable here and you're not feeling any discomfort in the back or the hips, you can go ahead and let go of everything everywhere. Go ahead and release all of that effort and just allow yourself to weigh heavy on the props, heavy on the floor. Observe the rhythm and pace of your breath. Sometimes we might manipulate it and breathe deeper or longer. For right now, just observe the natural harmony of your inhale and your exhale. And we'll prepare to come up. You can gently move the fingers, move the toes, bend your knees so the feet are flat on the floor. And you'll roll off to your side and come up to sit. So that's a very nice restoring back bend over some support. It can really bring some nice relief to the neck and to the upper back if it's feeling achy. So you're gonna go ahead and clear your mats off and you're gonna need some blocks or a chair. If the hamstrings are really tight and you notice that the low back rounds as we do forward bends with the legs straight, then it might even be beneficial to have a chair. We're gonna use the long edge of the mat. So I'm gonna demonstrate kind of where we're headed and then we're gonna to do together. So I'm, we're gonna jump or step the feet wide I'm lining my heels up with the back edge of the mat so that I know my heels are even with my hips. And we'll lean forward. This pose is called Prasarada Padottanasana. From here, some of you guys will be ready to walk the hands forward. I'm pressing my thighs back to the wall behind me and letting the head hang. Notice if your hips are falling backwards and see if you can actually bring your hips forward slightly so that there's a little bit more pressure on the toe ball mounts. From here, we'll walk the blocks in. Now, this is where we start to move into other poses. I'm gonna turn my left toes in slightly, my right foot out 90 degrees. I'm pivoting on my toe ball mount to bring my heel in slightly. Then I'm gonna take one of my blocks, swing it to the outside of my leg, and now here I am in Utita Trikonasana, expanded triangle pose, or extended triangle pose. And then we'll come back forward. So I'm bending that knee, first bringing the block forward, pivoting on the toes, taking the heel back, back to Prasarada Padottanasana. So I'll do the other side just to demonstrate in case you've never done this. Right toes in slightly, lifting the left heel up, pivoting on the toes, block comes to the outside of that left ankle, straightening the legs, turning towards the ceiling. You can even reach that right arm up and overhead if you feel comfortable doing so. And then bringing the hand back down, bending the knee, hands come forward, pivoting on the toes to take the heel back. And we'll be here and we'll end up doing either each side one more time or we'll come out. All righty. So that's what you're going to need a long edge of your mat, some blocks, or a chair. If you're using the chair, then you will have to move it. You can move it in front of you rather than out to the side. And then let's go ahead and get started. So jump or step the feet wide. Notice how your heels are placed in relationship to your mat. You want that back of the heel to be lined up and you want the heels to be even from left to right, meaning that you want that space between the edge of the mat and your heel to be the same on both sides. And look at your toes and I want you to turn your toes in. It almost feels like it's, it's pretty significantly turned in today. And as the toes turn in, Try to stretch into that outer heel, outer foot bone. Often we feel a lot of weight on the inner foot or the big toe ball mount. See if you can really stretch that outer ankle, pinning the outer heel down and pinning that pinky toe down to the floor. 
Then with your hands on your hips, we wanna bend at that hip crease that we found earlier. So you can use your hands to even reference that area. But we're not bending in the abdomen and rounding the back, right? Instead, we wanna keep the spine straight, bend in the hips. This is where we get some more hip mobility, get a nice length in the back of the legs, and then hands to the chair or the blocks. Taking a smooth, steady inhale and exhale here. Try to straighten the legs completely. And as you lean forward slightly, notice where your weight sits on the bottom of your foot. So you can feel, you can even play with this. As you lean back, you're gonna feel that your weight is more on the heels. And then as you lean forward, you're gonna feel how it shifts more to the toes. See if you can lean forward so that there's a little bit more weight on the toes. And ultimately we're using that reference to line the heels up with our hips, or rather to line the hips up with the heels. Often in this pose, a lot of students, and even in my practice, I'll find that my hips are pushing back behind my heels, just for balance usually. But we wanna have the hips over the heels here. And then you're gonna walk your hands forward. So now we're making the sideways long, arms go straight out in front of us. If you feel any discomfort in the arms and the neck, then, or even in the low back with this, then you can just have your hands underneath your shoulders. As you press the palms down, draw the shoulders away from the ears, press that pinky toe down, outer heel toe down into the floor, and you're gonna feel that as you lift your hips back to the wall behind you, and the arms are pulling you forward, that there's this nice stretch in the sides of the spine, in the side waists. Try to use that pressure of the thighs back to actually lift the chest forward. So the work of the legs, becomes the anchor for us to grow from. And then you'll bring your blocks back towards you or your chair back towards you. So now the wrists are underneath the shoulders. Now we're gonna move off to the right. So you're gonna turn your left toes in slightly, lift your right heel and pivot on those toe ball mounts so that that foot turns out 90 degrees. Now, if you were to look at your feet, the inner edge of your right foot should draw a line and hit the big toe on your back foot. The more traditional alignment is gonna have that uh, front foot in line with the arch of your back foot. But for today, we're gonna have the inner foot on the right side in line with the big toe on the left foot. And taking the block around, straighten the legs. Here we are in Utita Trikonasana. So you straighten the legs, lift the chest, and even turn the rib cage up towards the ceiling. As you press that left thigh back, the thigh on the back leg, take a few breaths. Notice how your weight sits in your feet and how both of the feet might be different. You can keep your gaze forward and chin in line with the chest if the neck is bothered but some of you are ready to gaze up to the ceiling. Some might even feel comfortable reaching that left arm up and overhead. And then bringing the hand down, bend the right knee, bring the block forward, and you'll lift your right heel up and pivot the heel back. Now you can align the heels with the back edge of the mat in case they shift it at all. And then turn the toes in and we'll do the other side. Right toes turn in, lift the left heel, pivot on the toe ball mount, reach the block to the outside of your left ankle, and then straighten the legs. Inner edge of your left foot draws a line and bisects the arch or the big toe on the right foot. With the legs nice and straight, press the right thigh back, turn the chest up towards the ceiling. You can take the gaze up to the ceiling if you feel comfortable doing so. And then reach the right fingertips up and overhead. The wrists are still in line with the shoulders here. Palm is open, facing the wall in front of you. And then hand to the hip. You can bend that right knee, bring the block forward, pivot on the toe ball mount, and bring the heels back to alignment in the back of the mat. Toes turn in, again, pretty significantly today. Pinning that pinky toe down, outer heel down. We're gonna do each side one more time. So left toes are turned in, lift the right heel, 
pivot on that foot, bring the right hand alongside the right ankle and straighten the legs. As you press that left thigh back, lift the chest away from your thighs and turn the rib cage up towards the ceiling. Remember what it felt like to have that roll in your upper back. The shoulders were able to pull away from the ears, the back of the neck felt quite long. See if you can integrate that sensation and that practice in your body here in Uttita Trikonasana. And if you feel comfortable, reach the left fingertips up towards the ceiling. And hand comes back to the hip, bend the right knee, bring the blocks forward, bring that heel back with the toes forward. Last side, last time for Uttita Trikonasana. Right toes turn in, left toes turn out. Left hand comes to the outside of the left ankle. And if you're feeling comfortable in this pose, you can start to lower the block down to the floor, start to lower down what it is you're using for support. Should have maybe said that earlier, but in the future, you can always move a little bit deeper as we progress in the poses. Pressing the right thigh back, turning the rib cage up towards the ceiling and then reach the right fingertips up and overhead. If you're feeling like the shoulder is lifting up into the neck and the ears, then keep your right hand on your hip and instead use your elbow to pull back. As you pull the elbow back, the shoulder pulls back and you're able to help integrate that turn of the rib cage in the chest. And then hand down, bend the knee, blocks come forward. Pivot on the toes so that the heels are nice and wide. And then walk the blocks forward. The legs wide, blocks walk forward. Taking a few breaths here. Now you can stay in this position or bring your wrists back underneath the shoulders with the back flat. Some of you who have practiced this before are familiar. You can actually bring your hands between your ankles and let the head hang. So this is the more traditional Prasarada Padottanasana. Hands are between the ankles, letting the head hang, elbows bend slightly, and it's almost like you're reaching your head to the floor. It's okay if your head doesn't touch the floor today. What I want you to focus on is straightening the legs completely, weighing a little bit heavier on the toe side of the body, and then using the arms to lift the shoulders away from the ears. Now letting gravity lengthen the spine. And then uh, lift the chest forward so the back is nice and flat. And you can walk your hands forward, hands on the hips to come up to stand. Heel, toe, step the feet together and stand. And as you stand, you'll find that you're in Tadasana, mountain pose. So feet together, big toe ball mounts, inner heels touching as you lift the chest up nice and tall. Taking a nice deep inhale, nice deep exhale. So we've done some great standing poses. We're gonna start to move into some more stuff on the floor, which you're gonna need a block for. Just one block to start. We're gonna practice Setu Bandha Sarvangasana. But first we're gonna practice a pose that will prepare us for Satu Bandha. You can use a strap if you'd like for this next pose, Chatush Padasana. This is four-footed pose. I'm gonna demonstrate just a couple of variations when coming into Chatush Padasana, and then you can decide what is best for you. So if we're using the strap, feet come flat to the floor, toes turn in slightly, and I have the strap over the tops of my feet with the tail ends within an arm's reach. I'm gonna scoop my hips towards my heels as long as my knees are comfortable, and then I can come to lay down on the floor. From here, I'm gonna hold on to the tail ends of my strap. As I try and walk my hands down the strap, I have to observe if my shoulders are lifting up towards the ceiling or if I can actually press them down to the floor. As I continue to walk my hands down the strap, Shoulders actually tuck in and underneath. Then I'm going to press my feet down, press my upper arms down, and lift the hips up. As soon as the hips are lifted, I have a little bit more space 
to tuck the shoulders in, to maybe walk the hands a little bit closer to the feet. Chatush Padasana. Now, if you don't have a strap, or maybe you just don't want to use it, <laughs> you can use the side edges of the mat as well. Pressing the feet down, holding onto the side edges of the mat. I'm turning my inner arms up, outer arms down, as I tuck the shoulders underneath me. Again, once the hips are lifted, you're gonna find that you have a little bit more space to tuck the shoulders under once more. Chatush Padasana, four-footed pose. So that's what we're practicing right now. So we'll go ahead and get started. So again, you can decide if you wanna use the strap. It gives you a different relationship with your hands to your feet, or you can use the side edges of the mat, whichever you would like to try today. So we'll start with the feet flat on the floor. The feet are about hip width apart. Then as you turn the toes in, you can place the strap across the tops of your feet if that's what you're using. Try to keep your feet planted down as you shift your hips towards your heels and then bring your elbows to the floor and then lying down flat on the floor. As you take a few breaths here, you can just let go of any tension in the shoulders or the arms. As you hold onto the tail ends of your strap or the side edges of your mat, you start to walk your hands towards your feet. As you do this, turn your inner arms up, outer arms down, so that whole upper arm bone, the humerus bone, is rolling out to the side walls. Both of them are rolling away from the body. So inner arms roll up, outer arms roll down. Then see if you can actually lean over to one side and tuck your shoulders underneath you. It is a little bit more of an effortful movement in the upper back, since we are trying to squeeze the shoulder blades in towards the spine. But as you practice this with your hips on the floor, try to let go of any tension in the neck. We haven't even pressed up yet, and you can start to notice if there's tension in the upper back, if there's tension in the neck, it can be let go of. And we'll press the feet down, lift the hips up. As you press the feet down, give a nice deep exhale and try and tuck your tailbone towards your calves and lift the hips with the pressure of your feet. As you press your upper arms down, try to lift your back ribs up off the floor. Now you're gonna notice that you might have a little bit more space to tuck the shoulders underneath you, to walk your hands a little bit closer to the feet. Ultimately, we want more of our weight to come to the tops of our shoulders rather than the backs of the shoulders. As you press the feet down, as you press the upper arms down, lift the back ribs up, lift the hips up. Chatush Padasana, four-footed pose and then come back down to the ground. So we'll do one more time. Can let go of any tension that might have risen, any tension in the neck or the face. And then we'll do again. So you'll decide if you want to use the tail ends of the straps or the sides of the mat. Acknowledge if your feet shifted or moved in any way and see if you can keep them lined up with each other, lined up with the hips, and the toes turned in slightly. And holding on to the strap or the side edges of the mat, turn the inner arms up, outer arms down, tuck the shoulders underneath you. As you press the upper arms down, lift the back ribs up. As you press the feet down, lift the hips up. Tailbone tucks towards the calves. Keep rising the hips towards the ceiling. And you'll find that you have some space to tuck the shoulders underneath you again. Try and come to the tops of the shoulders. And as you breathe, let go of the gripping in the throat, in the jaw. See if you can soften the back of the neck, kind of like you did with the neck tractioning that we practiced this morning, just a little bit ago. Use the four contact points on the floor, really the upper arms and the feet to be the anchor of thought for you to lift the hips and lift the rib cage away from. And then bring the hips back down. You can rest the thighs against each other, walk the feet wide. So the next pose that we practice is gonna be Setu Bandha Sarvangasana. This is to form a bridge pose. And it is a preparatory pose for shoulder stand, but really it's a, it's a nice back bend and the way that we're gonna practice today will definitely have some support. 
So you can roll to your side, press yourself up, move your strap out of the way if that's what you were using and have your block nearby. I'm just gonna demonstrate really briefly and then we'll practice together. So I'm gonna start coming into this pose just like we did with the last one. It's the same as coming into Chatush Parasana, four-footed pose. We're just gonna add a little bit to it. So I'm starting by tucking the shoulders underneath me, pressing the feet down, lifting the hips up, tucking the shoulders once more. So more of my weight is on the tops of the shoulders. Then I'm gonna grab my block. Now your block has a couple different heights, low setting, medium setting, and a tall setting. If you've done the tall setting before and you feel comfortable with it, you can go ahead and practice. I'm gonna show on the, the medium setting today. I want the block to span across the back of my pelvis and it's gonna be under my tailbone. I'm gonna rest my tailbone on that block and then straighten the legs. So from here, I still am using that pressure of my upper arms into the floor to lift my back ribs up. And then you can even let the palms rest on the floor, palms facing the ceiling. Taking a few breaths here in Setu Bandha Sarvangasana. If you feel any achiness or irritation in the body, you can come out of this pose or you can keep the knees bent here. This is also a nice support for a back bend and some work in the upper back if you have achiness in the upper back or even if you suffer from migraines and headaches. This is a great thing to practice. And then to come out, I'm lifting my hips up, removing the block, and resting my hips back on the floor. All righty, so that's what we're up to. So you can go ahead and grab your block, have it nearby, start by coming into Chatush Parasana. And then, We'll lie back, grab onto the sides of the mat. Since we don't have the strap, strap now, since we're gonna straighten the legs and turn the inner arms up, outer arms down, tuck the shoulders underneath you. And as you press your feet down, lift the hips up. Once you've lift the hips, go ahead and tuck the shoulders underneath you once more. Start to walk onto the tops of the shoulders and then grab your block, place it underneath your hips, really underneath the tailbone specifically, and then straighten the legs. As you straighten the legs, try to have the toes pointing up towards the ceiling. Inner thighs roll down to the floor. So if your thighs were rolling pins, they would roll towards each other. As you take a few breaths here, to soften the face, the eyes and the throat. You can rest the backs of your hands on the floor with the palms facing the ceiling. There's a little bit of pressure in the upper arms pressing onto the floor, really from the elbow to the back of the shoulder. As you press the upper arm down, notice if the shoulders are lifting in towards the ears, or you can actually start to pull the shoulders away from the ears. As you take a smooth, steady inhale, smooth, steady exhale. Notice if there's any subconscious or unnecessary tension that might have risen that can be let go of. In our asana yoga practice, so these poses are called asanas. They really are postures. Yoga is defined as chitta vritti narodaha. That's Sanskrit for stilling the fluctuations of the consciousness. So here we can practice asanas and not practice yoga. All right, we can be in these postures and the mind is running, mind is wandering, but really how can we access that yoga, that, chill, that uh, stilling of the fluctuations in the consciousness? As you tune in to different anchor points in your body, 
really noticing where is your body touching the floor or being supported by a prop? And how does that affect the space that's not being supported by the prop? As we start to anchor our mind into these observations, and the mind starts to calm, it starts to become a little bit more focused. As you feel your breath move through the pose, move through your body, this also can become an anchor point. It's natural for the mind to wander. But there's these little glimpses of opportunity. There's these little windows of being able to see, maybe get a, just a little taste of what it would be like for the mind to be calm, still, and focused on the breath, focused on the simplicity of your inhale. And then to come out, you'll bring your feet towards your hips, feet flat to the floor, and press your feet down, lift the hips up, tailbone tucks towards the calves as you lower the hips down to the floor. Just taking a few breaths here with the thighs resting against each other. The feet can walk wide. Let go of any tension that might have risen through the practice. And then you'll take your arm up and overhead, roll to your side, and press yourself up. Now this next pose, I would have to say, is probably one of my favorite poses of all time. After this, we are going to set up for Shavasana, or corpse pose. I want to share with you a more propped version of this pose and then one without so many props in case that's what you're dealing with at home. So normally if we were in a yoga studio, it'd be great to have a bolster or a stack of blankets underneath our upper body, underneath the rib cage. And then we would have a blanket, maybe even folded once more from shelf fold for underneath the head. And so we would have this extra support under the rib cage. Since it's morning, this can be a little bit more uplifting. We start to end class with a supported back bend in this position, which generally integrates a energizing effect and a little bit more of an emotional balance. However, it's not totally necessary. And then we would use a blanket. We'll unfold it a couple of times. So from this position, shelf fold, we're gonna unfold it twice. So if I unfold it once, it looks like this. If I unfold it twice, it looks like this. I wanna unfold it twice from shelf fold, and then I'm gonna roll the long edge. So if you don't have this bolster, that's absolutely fine. You can just practice with some support underneath the head. I wanna demonstrate with the bolster just because there's a little bit more attributes to be mindful of with the prop placement. So I want to start with, uh, we're going to come into Setu or Supta Bada Konasana, sorry. So feet together, knees wide, and Supta means recline. So I'm going to lay back in bound angle pose. I want to have about two fists distance between my pelvis and the bolster. So there's some space there, pretty significant amount of space there. Then I'm going to place this rolled blanket on my feet and sweep the tail ends underneath my thighs so that they're sweeping along the floor, going underneath my thighs. And then I'm pinning it with my legs here. I'm just demonstrating and I, I'm gonna walk you through it again so that you can watch. If you've never done this, then you'll get an idea of where we're headed. And then I'm gonna take my hands alongside the bolster behind me and lie back. Can adjust the blanket support so it's underneath the head. Now this is where things, this is an important change and shift. I'm taking my hands and I'm literally gonna scoop the flesh of my buttocks away from me. Grab onto the tail ends of the blankets and if you feel comfortable, you can bring your feet in a little bit closer and pin the tail ends of the blanket underneath the hips here. So this is Supta Bada Konasana, reclined bound angle pose. Again, the bolster is not necessary. 
and everything else would still apply. The placing of the blanket underneath the head, the scooping of the flesh of the buttocks, and then the tucking of the tail ends underneath the hips. To come out, we're gonna move into Shavasana. So we're gonna straighten the legs. You can remove that rolled blanket completely, or if your hips and low back tend to get achy, it's nice to have that support under the knees. So you can decide what support you would like, whether you remove that rolled blanket or you place it underneath the knees. Shavasana, corpse pose. This is where we let go of everything everywhere and really absorb what our body has gone through and experienced in class. And we'll bend the knees, roll to the side, and come up and carry on with our day. So that's Supta Mata Konasana. Let's go ahead and practice together now. So whether you're using a bolster or not, then you can sit on the floor, have a blanket prepared to be underneath your head. You're gonna have this rolled, long rolled blanket that goes on the tops of the feet. So you take a nice deep inhale and exhale, soften the face and the eyes. Like of any tension that's risen from all the instruction, from all the prop management. And with that blanket on the tops of the feet, you're gonna find the tail ends of the blanket, sweep them along the floor, and tuck them underneath your thighs. It might not make it to the hips all the way today, but you want them to just be held so that you can reach them when you go to lay back. Then hands go behind you, behind the hips, you can bend the elbows and lie back. You can adjust the support underneath your head so that the head and the neck is resting on the blanket. Have the shoulders free from support. And you can take a moment using your hands, tuck the flesh of the buttocks away from you. You can even do that a couple of times. And grab onto the tail ends of your blanket. See if you can pull the feet in a little bit closer. Feet are still, the bottoms of the feet, soles of the feet are touching while the knees go wide. And you can even place the tail ends of the blanket underneath your hips, underneath the thighs. This really adds some support where the femur bone, where your thigh bone comes into the pelvis. So that's really what we're looking to provide here with tucking the blanket under the hips. And then you'll rest your hands off to the sides. If you feel like you need some grounding emotionally, or if the mind is wandering, then you can have your palms facing the floor. If you feel like you are in a more open state, energized state, where you feel comfortable managing the mind as it wanders, you have that as a practice, you can have the palms facing upwards, facing the ceiling. If you take a few breaths here, just start to let go, releasing your body weight, resting heavy on the floor. There's this conceptual experience of observing different points in, in a more uh, intellectual way. So the mind is working to observe. And as you start to feel your breath, in your lungs, as you start to feel the weight of your body resting on the props or resting on the floor. Now we start to observe and tune into more of an experiential observation. It's natural for the mind to wander. It can be helpful to find an attribute to use as an anchor, which will work as a reminder to bring your mind back to your body, back to your breath. With practice, the breath alone can be enough of an anchor. But for those whose minds are very active, who habitually wander. This is where it can be helpful to focus on the palms resting on the floor, to focus on the sensation of your arm resting on the floor.
And as you observe the natural harmony and rhythm of your breath, just feel how it affects your rib cage, how the breath affects the lungs. Noticing the details, the small, subtle details. Observing how the air passes over your upper lip and into your nostrils before it moves down the throat and into the lungs. Noticing where in the lungs the air fills. You're welcome to stay in this position for Shavasana, or you can bring your thighs together and straighten the legs. Feel free to use that rolled blanket underneath your knees if you would like, or you can remove it completely. Whichever position you decide to use, just let go of everything, everywhere. And as the mind wanders, gently bring it back to your breath, back to that anchor point you felt was beneficial to focus on. And slowly place your hands on your abdomen, on your belly, Take a moment to appreciate your body for all that it's done and all that it will do. Appreciate your mind for taking the time to practice and harmonize with your body today. Acknowledge your heart. Feel gratitude for that organ in your chest that's dedicated to life. And we'll start to move slowly to come up. We'll start by bending the knees, taking the arm up and overhead. And as you roll to your side, rest your head on your upper arm for a few breaths. Feel free to take your time coming up to a comfortable seated posture. And when you do, feel free to use the props around you to sit comfortably. I appreciate you all for taking the time to practice asanas and yoga today. Namaste. Well, thank you all for being here and for taking the time to practice with me. So great that you could join. I truly adore these Saturday morning classes because they are a little bit more restorative and rebalancing. So I hope that you can make it to future classes. If you're available on Wednesday mornings, I also do another live class at 
uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Time on Wednesday mornings. So that one's a little bit more active. We're usually doing some more inversions and standing poses and things like that. So nice midweek practice. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or ask me. Otherwise, I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your day and rest of your weekend. And I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you for being here.